Um, so welcome to anybody who's joining us on Zoom. Uh, we are just getting started. Dr. Afrin is here via audio and video. Um, we're just getting the things started and I'm gonna link to Facebook, but for those that are joining and filtering in on Zoom, welcome and just hang tight. Uh, we look forward to talking to everybody and just please remember that we can communicate in the chat uh, or you can submit a question through the Q&A and I will explain this again once we're on Facebook, but just hang tight. All right, we've got several people already, Dr. Afrin, so thank you for being here. My pleasure. Please, off the Wi-Fi. Sorry, I have to kick everybody off the Wi-Fi. They're like, do you want me to be off the Wi-Fi? Yes, I do. <laughs> Let me pick the page. All right, we're linking to Facebook. And we're almost rocking and rolling. I will say for those that are waiting on Zoom, that the previous recordings are also recorded and edited and up on YouTube. Um, and if you don't know where they are, I will share them again, but I've also found a way to do transcription. I don't know how effective it is just yet or how perfect, but I found a way to be able to do transcription, to be able to post previous Q and A's and webinars, uh, the content from it. I just have to make sure that it's medically sound, but I have found a way to do that. And also closed captioning, I am getting there. So this is a great opportunity. So just in case anybody's interested, all right, so live. Facebook has all these different things that you can do when you go live and how you link it and if people game and, and everything live it's pretty it, it's pretty incredible what they've done but it's also can be very daunting because they seem to update the, the dashboard all the time so we're linking and we're almost ready to go it looks like we're live so let me just turn down my phone Dr. Afrin because I read the comments on the Facebook page the questions um, from my phone. So welcome to everybody that's live and let's live here on Zoom. We're officially welcoming. Welcome, Dr. Afrin. Thank you for being here again for another live community MCAS q and I am Kendra Nielsen-Miles. I am the executive director and founder of EDS Wellness, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. I am also the owner and founder principal of Sisters Media, which published Dr. Afrin's book, and I run the Mass Cell Research page. And we're here to celebrate the five-year anniversary of Dr. Afrin's book. And I'm not going to give too much of an introduction. I just want to make sure the um, lighting and sound is okay on everybody's end. Dr. Afrin is here via audio only, not video. I am audio and video. Um, my house was just being painted, so my lighting and, and everything is not so great, but hopefully you guys can hear me and see me. Please let me know if you cannot. And we're just gonna go ahead and get uh, into the questions if that's all right. Dr. Afrin, are you ready to go? Sounds good. All right, so you can go ahead and please remember that this is for informational and educational purposes only. This is not for medical diagnosis, medical advice, anything personal to you. If you have questions, please put them in the chat in Zoom or under the live feed on the Mass Cell Research Facebook page. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, anything that's longer or more personal, we cannot answer. It's harder to read and obviously personal questions cannot be answered. This is just, again, for informational educational purposes only. The more broad, the more general, the better the question, the more likely we can answer it. And we're gonna go ahead and start with, while I look at the questions and comments, uh, because we said special focus on long COVID. So Dr. Afrin, would you mind giving us an overview on long COVID and your hypothesis on the perspective on link to long COVID and MCAS? Well, long COVID is the informal term being used for a uh, large collection of uh, post-COVID chronic uh, multi-system inflammatory syndromes um, and there is some suspicion emerging 
among some investigators that um, uh, mast cell activation syndrome, uh, one variant or another might be at the root of not only why a minority fraction of the COVID infected population unfortunately comes to suffer a very severe course of that disease, but also why um, a proportion of the COVID infected population goes on to uh, develop uh, long haul syndrome of one sort or another. The, uh, the concept, and, and let's be real clear, we're talking hypothesis here. There's been zero research done to prove or disprove this hypothesis, but the, uh, the concept is that there's something about the COVID virus that uh, provokes the dysfunctional mast cells that drive the, um, uh, the, the symptoms in an MCAS patient. Uh, frankly, whether they're recognized as having MCAS or, or not yet recognized and diagnosed as having it, but these dysfunctional mast cells seem to be reacting um, quite inappropriately to uh, the acute infection in uh, a number of patients. And that's leading, uh, again, again we, we suspect this is uh, the principal driver of the hyper-inflammatory cytokine storms that are driving the acute infection to be a very severe course in a minority of the folks who are getting the acute infection. Uh, but then um, it's also these dysfunctional mast cells that are probably um, acquiring yet additional dysfunction consequential to all the, uh, the stressors of uh, both physical and psychological stressors of the acute infection and by driving the baseline level of misbehavior of the dysfunctional mast cells in these patients to an even higher state of dysfunction. Uh, this may be uh, the, the key driver of the various generally inflammatory processes that seem to be going on in the long haul uh, patients. And if this hypothesis can be proven, then it raises the possibility that uh, treatment targeted at mast cell disease might um, not only be able to reduce the uh, severity of uh, the acute COVID illness um, in those patients who come to suffer a severe course of that disease, <clears throat> excuse me. And it might also uh, reduce uh, the severity or duration or both. Uh, again, we don't know, the research hasn't been done, but there's the possibility that uh, mast cell targeted treatment might wind up making long haul uh, better. Anecdotally, I can tell you that I've um, heard from a number of patients um, who unfortunately had suffered COVID infection and then come to develop long haul, who had not been able to find any, uh, uh, any improvement, but then upon coming to realize a possibility that it might be uh, mast cell misbehavior at, at the root of their long haul troubles, they then started applying various mast cell targeted treatment. And sometimes it's been as simple as just an H1 blocker with or without an H2 blocker that sometimes has made a, uh, uh, a dramatic difference 
in their long haul syndrome. But again, this is anecdotal, does not at all constitute uh, what any doctor would regard as rigorous research and that research needs to be done. Um, so I'll stop at this point. Uh, along that same line and to tie it into what has been published, is, is any of the research or do you believe or feel that any of the research that is being done that has been published or, or talked about is linking or to the MCAS piece or is looking at that piece as part of the research or linking to other conditions that are comorbid that could be also part of this? Yeah, there are a few small studies that have been published um, and when I say few, I, I think I can, I, I think it may be one or two <laughs> uh, that have demonstrated that the H2 blocker famotidine uh, can be helpful in acute um, COVID illness, uh, possibly also in long haul, but those papers did not make a clear connection to uh, MCAS. There's a large study going on right now, um, uh, sponsored by NIH, uh, many different American academic medical centers uh, participating in it. That's looking at whether um, the COVID vaccines will cause uh, what, what basically looking at what percentage of patients with substantial allergy problems, including um, uh, mast cell activation disorders will react severely to uh, one or another of the COVID vaccines uh, within the first um, a couple of hours after getting the shot. And that study I think is looking uh, to accrue, if I'm remembering correctly, somewhere around 3000 patients and is expected to be finished. I think it's, it's, um, it was scheduled to be open this month and to finish accruing the, uh, the, the, the subjects in May with uh, first uh, reports from the study to be uh, published uh, as early as June, uh, certainly a very ambitious uh, schedule. Um, but again, we have to keep in mind that's just looking at a very narrow focus of you know, what, what patients' immediate reactions to the vaccines will be. And it could be that some patients with mast cell disease are having, uh, they might have issues with the vaccine that might come on somewhat later. Um, so bottom line is that what we actually know about the intersection between COVID and mast cells in general, let alone MCAS, um, the intersection between both the disease, uh, the acute disease, the long haul disease and the vaccines and the intersection of all that with mast cells and MCAS, uh, that, that intersection is virtually nothing. And what we basically got are a tremendous number of questions that are just going to take an awful lot of time and other resources to answer if they ever do get answered. That's understandable. And of course, there's, you mentioned vaccines and people have questions about the vaccines and, you know, what do people do if they have MCAS as well? So prior to having COVID, if they've already had COVID, somebody asked, uh, and it's a little more of a a specific question about the vaccine that says, what are the concerns about an MRA, mRNA vaccine that can potentially cause autoimmune disease in those susceptible? I read that correctly. So I guess there's some speculation that mRNA vaccine can cause, potentially cause autoimmune disease in those susceptible. I'm assuming the possible link to those who have MCAS. Do you know anything about that or have you heard about that? 
I don't think uh, there have been any solid data showing a significant increase in risk uh, for developing autoimmune disease from any of the uh, presently available vaccines. Um, You've got to keep in mind that autoimmune diseases, as an as a t taken as a an entire group, are relatively common, and therefore you take any group of patients, let alone the uh, billions around the world we hope to uh, immunize, and it's kind of inevitable that a group that large is going to develop autoimmune diseases. Um, so figuring out whether any of these vaccines actually triggered, uh, any given patient's autoimmune disease, that's, that's going to be pretty tricky. Um, I think that'll have to be taken on a, that, that sort of analysis has to be taken on a case by case basis, uh, by the doctors who will be most intimately familiar with all of the details in each such patient's case. But at the moment, we, we just can't make any generalizations and the available data don't suggest any uh, known uh, increased uh, risk for autoimmune or frankly any other diseases that I'm aware of from getting any of these uh, vaccine products. Somebody asked uh, along the same line, and I think we're just, I think you can answer this pretty quickly because you've already answered it somewhat before in other Q and A's and it's along the same lines. If somebody has, has MCAS and they have a history of anaphylactic reaction, uh, the concerns or not of the COVID vaccine, I know everything's really personal and we can't give personal advice. Um, yeah. I, I, I can understand why somebody who's um, anaphylaxed previously might have concerns, but um, that has to be weighed against the very real, very serious concern about an unvaccinated person acquiring uh, infection from this virus, which is known to be present at pandemic levels in the population and which is and, and a virus which is known to be extraordinarily contagious and that's just the wild type virus let alone the assorted variants that are now emerging around the world that seem to be even more contagious so i don't think there's going to be any uh, any easy yes or no answer to, you know, should I or should I not get vaccinated for people who have had troubles um, with anaphylaxis in the past? Because uh, I think everybody's going to approach this, this balancing of the benefits from gaining protection against a terrible virus uh, against the risks. Um, I, I think it's got to be approached individually in every patient, every pay, every such patient probably needs to have a careful discussion with his or her, uh, doctor, um, to try to sort out all the issues that may be applicable in that particular patient's case. Uh, it's very hard to make generalizations uh, in this sort. Not the only generalization I can make is that in my time, my uh, roughly 13 years now, uh, tending to mast cell disease across thousands of patients um, in general. And, and again, it's just a generalization. You can always find exceptions. But in general, um, mast cell patients past performance with any given type of treatment uh, or exposure tends to be predictive of how they're going to do, how they'll perform with future similar exposures. So if the patient has done okay with vaccinations in the past, 
they're likely to do well with vaccinations of any type, whether for COVID or for any other infectious disease in the future. Does that guarantee that they won't have a problem with any particular vaccine in the future? Uh, of course not. Um, I guess the other generality that kind of makes sense, but again, no actual research has been done yet to prove or disprove this, but it would seem reasonable that in patients who have severe forms of MCAS and who unfortunately have not yet gained um, at least some modicum of control over their dysfunctional mast cells, I think it would be natural to um, be suspicious that those people would be the ones who would be more likely to suffer significant adverse reactions to a vaccination. And, and let's be clear, a vaccination is designed to be a major stressor to the immune system in the body. Um, it's designed to look like an infection just to not actually be the infection. Um, and uh, we know that stressors, especially major stressors, have potential to uh, trigger the activation of mast cells. So whether we're talking about acute reactions or we're talking about delayed or sustained or chronic reactions to the vaccine. Somebody who's got bad mast cell disease that just has not, they, they, they've just not gotten any control over it yet. Uh, I, it's possible they might be more likely to have troubles, acute or chronic with uh, vaccination. But again, even that, e even if they are more likely to have those troubles, that doesn't necessarily say they shouldn't get vaccinated. Again, it has to be weighed against the, the, the seriousness of the, the virus, um, how prevalent it is, how serious a disease it can cause, uh, both acutely and chronically. So these decisions have to be made individually for every patient. What I've been saying is that patients, and again, this is just anecdotal, what I've been seeing in my population, this is not a study. This, this does not constitute any reliable data uh, on which one can base uh, a decision. But what I've been seeing in my patient population is that those mast cell patients who have already gained at least some control over their dysfunctional mast cells, they seem to be tolerating vaccination pretty well. I have seen a couple of patients who have had uh, significant trouble from one type of vaccination or another. I haven't seen any pattern to which type of vaccination. Um, but, um, but these are patients who had just had their MCAS recognized too recently, and we just haven't had uh, time yet to, uh, to get their MCAS under better control at the point where they made the decision to go ahead and get vaccinated. And, uh, and, and that wasn't necessarily a wrong decision for those patients to make. Again, different patients approach this decision in different ways. They've got different priorities. The fact is that even if you do have uh, MCAS and it's severe and it's poorly controlled, the odds are overwhelming that you're going to survive vaccination. There are extremely few people who have actually died uh, across, uh, you know, despite tens of millions of people um, now having been vaccinated, um, extremely few have died. So the odds are overwhelming that even if you have terribly controlled MCAS, uh, uh, you, you'll, you'll still almost certainly survive. That's not the issue. The issue is uh, what 
extent of adverse reactivity uh, might any individual uh, come to endure? And is that adverse reaction, um, is it worth it when offset against the benefits of uh, developing protection against the virus? Hard questions, Dr. Akron. It's hard for anybody, I mean, including myself, I am an MCAS patient as well, and I've also had reactions to previous shots. Um, so it's hard, you know, it's, I can empathize, and as, a, as you said as well, we can empathize with the pe people's concern, and, and, but you, you make a very good point about weighing the severity of getting COVID too. Um, and that's just so individual. So I'm actually going, there's several other questions that I think are very good related to COVID and the vaccines. And I would like to continue this discussion if we did want to focus on this. Uh, I do want to get to some general MCAS questions. We've received several that haven't been asked before that I think are very good. And then if we have time, we can come back to the COVID questions and just kind of dive more deeper, if that's all right with you, Dr. Afrin. Sure. All right. So somebody asked, could you please explain the difference between mast cell activation and hereditary alpha tryptosemia? Sure, great question. Um, in just the last few years, uh, in other words, an even shorter period of time than the short period of time about which we've known about um, uh, MCAS, we've come to realize there is a genetic condition that's present in, oh, roughly about 6% of people, at least in first world countries, uh, in which uh, there's more, uh, th 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 these, these people have extra, uh, one or more extra copies of the gene for making triptase. I, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but that's the gist of it. And in patients who have one or more extra copies, of the tryptase gene, um, uh, you'll, you'll see that the gene's name is TPS-AB1. And so we, we talk about TPS-AB1 redundancy uh, being the hallmark of this condition that's now being labeled as hereditary alpha tryptasemia that actually can be tested for uh, relatively inexpensively. Um, so about 6% of the population has this and because it's a genetic condition, so they've had the extra copy of the tryptase gene, uh, baked into the genetic code, uh, the genome in literally every cell of their body from literally conception all the way through and Till they die decades later. And these extra copies of the tryptase gene inescapably drive excessive production of tryptase. It's, it's not a, in, in the great majority of these patients, it's not a huge excess. Uh, it's usually pretty modest. Sometimes it's not even enough to lift the tryptase level uh, the, the, the concentration of, of the tryptase protein that's being made from the tryptase gene sometimes is not even enough to lift the uh, concentration of the tryptase protein uh, above the upper limit of the normal range. I mean, we know there are roughly, oh, about 8% or so of the population with hereditary alpha tryptasemia that have a completely normal um, uh, tryptase level. Um, but you can still find the, uh, the excess copies of the gene in them. Um, so the, and we also know that a large proportion um, of the population that has hereditary alpha tryptasemia have a large assortment of chronic multi-system inflammatory symptoms that 
uh, heavily overlap, uh, virtually indistinguishable from what we see in MCAS. And the question that naturally comes up is, is it this little bit of excess tryptase production that is actually driving all these symptoms? Um, and I don't know that anybody has a clear answer on that yet. My best guess is that since we know, uh, another thing we also know from the early research in hereditary alpha tryptasemia is that uh, there's also a, a small proportion of that population, again, roughly 8%. It varies a little bit from that figure depending on what study you look at, but roughly 8% of them actually don't have any symptoms at all. Yes, the majority of them do have MCAS-like symptoms, but many of these patients, um, well, not many, but, but some of these hereditary alpha tryptasemia patients who absolutely have an, a, a modestly elevated tryptase level, uh, and it's a very steady and stable thing because, again, it's baked into their genetic code. Um, and yet they have no symptoms at all. And so if the elevated tryptase in those patients is not causing any symptoms at all, it's not quite clear to me why we should go expecting that the elevated tryptase in all the other um, hereditary alpha tryptasemia patients who have an elevated tryptase, why should we go expecting that the modestly elevated tryptase in those patients is causing any of their MCAS-like symptoms? And I suspect that it probably isn't. Um, and instead, um, what I've been seeing in my patient population is that um, there is plenty of other evidence of mast cell activation um, in virtually every um, hereditary alpha tryptasemia uh, patient. And what they have is MCAS with the additional finding, kind of coincidental finding of hereditary alpha tryptasemia. But so far, we really don't know of any manner in which Hereditary alpha tryptasemia seems to affect a patient's prognosis. It doesn't seem to uh, say that those patients ought to be managed or treated in any particular way. Um, it, it's almost more as if, at least at present, again, everything could change with more research. But at present, I'm regarding uh, a, a hereditary alpha tryptasemia is more of a finding more so than an actual problem. If, if you understand the distinction I'm trying to make here, it, it's more of a finding than a problem which needs, uh, which is going to significantly impact the patient's life and potentially needs treatment. Um, but those patients could could easily have MCAS. And even though MCAS is not known to affect prognosis in most patients, obviously it causes symptoms in a lot of people and does need to be managed. So management would still be focused on the MCAS in those patients. We really don't know of any way that hereditary alpha tryptas, uh, tryptasemia needs to be managed. That's... Uh, any different than how MCAS gets managed. So it sounds as though it's somewhat of possibly a type of MCAS. Is that possible? Subset? Well, I, I, I just, know. not entirely sure I would say that. I, 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 I probably the best way to, the most accurate way to phrase it is that, yes, there is a subpopulation uh, probably a fairly small subpopulation of MCAS patients who have the additional finding of extra copies of the tryptase gene. But 
so far, nobody has identified any um, clinically significant consequences to having those extra copies of the alpha tryptase gene. So yes, you could technically say that having those extra copies of the tryptase gene defines a subpopulation of MCAS patients, but I don't know that it's a whole that it's all that useful to go defining subpopulations when there's really not going to be anything about a particular subpopulation that's different from the main population with regard to prognosis or treatment. Again, this could all change down the road with more research that actually does find something of prognostic or therapeutic significance in hereditary alpha tryptasemia, but we're not seeing any such findings in the early research. All right, well, along those same lines, talking about the differences between you know, alpha hereditary alpha tryptasemia, speaking, trying to ask a question really too fast, I should slow down. So between hereditary alpha tryptasemia and systemic mastocytosis, and mass activation, is it true that you can only be possible, positive for technically one of those conditions? No, no, because as we just said, you can easily have mast cell activation syndrome and also have hereditary alpha tryptasemia. It, it, where it perhaps becomes useful to understand that a patient has hereditary alpha tryptasemia is that in the minority of MCAS patients in whom we do find a mild elevation in tryptase, in the past, we've always taken that elevated tryptase to actually be a marker of activation of the mast cell. But now that we understand that there is this condition called hereditary alpha tryptasemia, where these patients have an extra copy of the tryptase gene that is just cranking out extra tryptase um, really without any regulation from, from conception to death. Uh, and, and, you know, in other words, in those patients, we should uh, expect that they're going to have a mildly elevated tryptase level well, in those patients, you obviously don't have nearly as much confidence that the elevated tryptase level in those patients truly reflects inappropriate activation of the mast cell that, of course, is the key feature of mast cell activation syndrome. Um, I would think that once you have found a patient to have an extra copy of the tryptase gene, you kind of have to assume that any extra tryptase, any tryptase that's, uh, any tryptase levels that are modestly above the upper limit of normal, you pretty much have to assume that they are consequential to uh, the extra copy of the tryptase gene. And therefore in those patients, it just strikes me, you can't really use that elevated tryptase level as a marker of uh, activation of the mast cell. So if you do have a clinical suspicion of MCAS in those patients, you're gonna have to find the evidence of activation through testing other than the tryptase level. And fortunately, there are, you know, quite a number of other tests that we can apply to, um, to see whether somebody has mast cell activation. All right, well, thank you. Somebody had asked that question about having all of them and is it, is it important to also test for all of them in order to rule anything else out? Um, you know, it is, uh, again, the, the, somebody, can have an extra copy of the tryptase gene independent of anything else going on in them. So yes, it's also possible to have systemic mastocytosis and also have hereditary alpha tryptasemia. But you got to keep in mind in those patients, 
the, the, the basic nature of systemic mastocytosis is that in the great majority of those patients, precisely because it's, um, it's a cancerous-like overproliferation, a gross overproliferation of the mast cells, the great majority of systemic mastocytosis patients are producing Ooh. very okay. high. We lost you for just a second, but you said that I lost you at, you said the great majority of mast cell patients something. No, I was saying that the great majority of mastocytosis, mastocytosis patients, patients sorry. have a substantially elevated tryptase level. And most of that tryptase is probably coming from, uh, from, from the overproliferation, the, the grossly excessive numbers of mast cells that those patients have, but could some portion of that substantial elevation in the tryptase level also be coming from the extra copy of the tryptase gene? that is in, in, in truth, it's in every cell in their body, including every one of those excessive numbers of mast cells. Yeah, that's, that's certainly possible. But again, having hereditary alpha tryptasemia in a systemic mastocytosis patient, it's not gonna change the prognosis. Uh, or the approach to management or treatment of the systemic mastocytosis. You're still going to do all the things you would do anyway to, to manage that case of mastocytosis, whether they have hereditary alpha tryptasemia or not. Thank you. Another question along the lines of... I'm, so, I'm sorry, can, can I jump in here and, and just yeah, sure. point out that... Folks need to be aware that there are so many genes in the human body <laughs> um, and, and so many um, base pairs of DNA. Um, it, it's essentially inevitable. If you look hard enough at the genetic code of anybody, you are going to find a mutation. Um, probably multiple mutations in, in everybody. So the, the issue is much, in fact, the issue is not at all whether somebody has mutations. You don't go assuming that just because somebody has mutations that they will have a disorder or a disease of some sort. The, the issue much more is are any of the mutations that somebody has, whether they're uh, inborn mutations or whether they are acquired mutations, the issue much more is, are these mutations clinically significant? And much of the time, they're not. So we now have this ability to define that Many people, as it turns out, do have this extra copy of the tryptase gene. But as best as I've been able to interpret from the literature I've seen, I'm just not seeing any clinical significance to that finding yet. Um, yes, they're making a little bit more tryptase than normal, but nobody has yet seen that that has any clinical significance uh, to it. So um, people need to be careful about not freaking out, so to speak, when they say do a 23andMe uh, whole genome analysis and they get back this uh, huge report that shows they've got all these mutations in them uh, you, you, you just can't freak out about that because the great majority of them, perhaps even all of uh, them, uh, probably will not have any uh, clinical significance. Uh, so it, 
unfortunately, our ability, our scientific, our technical ability to detect mutations has gotten way further ahead than our ability to understand what the significance of any given mutation is. And it's leading to an awful lot of anxiety by patients who are getting various genetic analyses done and saying, oh my God, I've got this mutation, I've got that mutation, my life is over, or I'm gonna have this problem or that problem, and no, 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 no. Everybody has mutations. Most of them are not significant, and you have to have some pretty careful and detailed discussions with whatever particular type of doctor it is who's best qualified to understand the significance or lack thereof of any particular mutation to help you understand what the true meaning for, for, for you, the individual patient is uh, of the information you're getting back in these reports. Well, I think that's a really good point. Also along the lines of why those that have the heter have the hereditary tryptosemia that there's a significant difference in terms of their presentation of symptoms. I mean, there's just a lot of different factors that go into how we present and what becomes pathogenic in our body. Is that correct too? I mean, we don't know why there's such a difference. Either somebody could have triple copies or double copies, why there's such a significant difference in how those present versus why those, somebody that doesn't have it has more severe symptoms. So we have so many well, genes and so many different factors that go into all of this. I mean, we know from the preliminary research in MCAS so far that the majority of MCAS patients um, have any of a huge variety of mutations in a wide variety of genes of regulatory importance to the mast cells. Um, and we also know from the preliminary research that most MCAS patients actually have not just one mutation in one gene of regulatory importance of the mast cell, but actually have multiple uh, mutations. And it's just the particular pattern, the particular profile of mutations that any given MCAS patient comes to acquire um, that is going to determine the particular patterns of uh, misbehavior of that patient's affected mast cells. And don't even go thinking that all of the patient's mast cells necessarily contain all these mutations because the research suggests they usually don't. Uh, probably a good portion of a mast cell patient's overall population of mast cells are completely normal. And it's just a fraction that bear these uh, mutations that are driving dysregulated behavior of those mutated mast cells. And it's just a particular pattern of mutations that defines the particular patterns of misbehavior we see, not only misbehavior at a baseline level, but, uh, you know, kind of constant, chronic, all the time misbehavior, what we call cons constitutive misbehavior, but also uh, reactive misbehavior, you know, reacting uh, to one provocation, one trigger or exposure or another. Um, different mutations might well lead a mast cell to react to different triggers. Um, the complexity of all this is just orders of magnitude beyond what doctors have had to deal with, with most diseases in the past. And I don't doubt we'll eventually get to a point where We'll have a much better understanding of all this, but 
patients have got to understand this is extraordinarily complex. It takes some very challenging research to really get definitive answers to any of these questions. And you look at how difficult it is to get resources for research and that starts to tell you right there, it's gonna be a long time before we have clear answers to uh, most people's questions about this disease. And as a patient who suffers myself, and I know so many like me, I mean, it's frustrating and you can even feel like you've got the answers and then something else happens, uh, just like, you know, your ANA becomes positive and you have a, you know, some kind of new something and, and you don't know how to really, what it means, if it means anything, because we all get tired, you know, do we have to go and look down the road? Should we, what does this mean? I you don't want to collect a label, but does it mean difference in treatment? You know, it's can be very confusing even for those that, that have been doing this for a while and kind of living it and trying to deal with it, let alone those that are new. And somebody asked the question, Dr. Akron, and they sent this to me via email, and I'm trying to get through to everybody's questions, as many as I possibly can, both in the chat and Zoom and under the Facebook feed and then also those on email. So just bear with us. Obviously, you can tell how it's complex and important to answer the questions as thoroughly as possible. But this were, uh, is in terms of people that like have the trifecta. So somebody, uh, can you still have MCAS if your base tryptase is low, 2.8, and your CKIT mutation is negative in peripheral blood? My uh, rheumatologist treating me is treating me for HEDS, or treat, I would say is treating somebody for HEDS and dysautonomia. Believes also there's an MCAS piece, but the immunologist says no because the testing I just said is negative. Yeah, um, the published research uh, strongly suggests that tryptase is normal and steadily so even during flares in about 85% of all MCAS patients. So a normal tryptase does not even begin to rule out MCAS. Um, and CKIT is detectable, uh, and, and, and we're talking specifically, uh, well, when we use the term CKIT, most uh, doctors are referring quite specifically to a mutation in codon 816 of the KIT um, uh, protein. Um, and... Um, we, we, we know from the published research that the CKIT mutation is present in an extremely small proportion of MCAS patients. So again, a negative CKIT mutation. Uh, yes, we, we, we know from uh, probably 20, 30 years of research now in uh, mastocytosis that the CKIT mutation is present in a very high proportion of mastocytosis patients. Uh, but mastocytosis is a different disease than MCAS. And in MCAS, uh, well, well, in mastocytosis, we expect to see the CKIT mutation. We expect to see a substantially elevated tryptase level. But in MCAS, tryptase is normal in about 85% of those patients. And in the majority of the other 15%, in whom the tryptase is elevated just modestly. In the majority of those patients, it's turning out that that elevated tryptase is just uh, a, a manifestation of hereditary alpha tryptasemia. And it still cannot be taken as a marker of actual activation of the mast cells. And so, so we know that, that tryptase is normal in 85% of MCAS patients. And we know that CKIT is uh, present, that, that mutation is present in a very tiny proportion of mast cell patients. So we expect most mast cell patients to have a normal tryptase level, and we expect the vast majority of MCAS patients to have a negative CKIT uh, mutation. Uh, th those tests are great tests for looking for mastocytosis, but they're not terribly helpful in looking for MCAS, and instead, there's other testing uh, to be looked at for MCAS. And 
uh, hopefully the rheumatologist that was mentioned a moment ago, hopefully at some point he'll be willing to learn about the other testing. Yeah, and, and that email just so I think is the, the rheumatologist was speculating from obviously they probably understand more of the trifecta and how it goes. It was the immunologist that was saying no um, because the test results were negative. And I think we've talked about that before because of training and different things and, and perspectives. So I'm glad that you touched on that. Um, somebody asked another good question. Uh, this came from somebody who's in Europe. So I wanted to make sure I uh, got to it because they're going to watch the recording, Dr. Afrin. So talking in about Europe, symptoms. Boy, that, yeah. uh, they're, they're uh, watching at a very late hour. I, yeah, we actually have several people that watch and would either watch the recording or send questions ahead of time or, or watch, stay up to watch it. So Dr. Afrin, you're getting around globally. People really appreciate your time in doing this. So I want to be cognizant of that and try to get to as many questions as possible, but also in understanding it's about 856. So, and we said we'll do an hour and I know we've done these before and hopefully we'll continue in the future. Uh, we just appreciate your time. So I'm going to try to get to this question uh, and then one more and then we can and discuss what time frame you would like to, to go with. Um, somebody said, the person said that after each meal, and I'm going to try to make this as general as possible. After each meal, uh, if somebody has a, you know, symptoms in their throat, dryness, hoarseness, uh, pain, sensation, like they can't swallow, uh, it's about lasts about two hours after eating. Um, sats are fine, so oxygen saturation is fine. Um, can this be an MCAS symptom rather than something like reflux or something problems with the cervical spine? Yeah, it's possible. Um, you know, I, I the, the general point to be made here is one I've made many times previously that you know I'm not. I, I've never said that every person who has some odd assortment of symptoms or some, you know, complex of chronic multi-system inflammatory and allergic issues, I'm not trying to say every one of those patients has MCAS at the root of it. What I think we need to understand, however, is that it's now pretty clear uh, that MCAS is a prevalent disorder. And therefore, in patients who do develop uh, chronic multi-system inflammatory and allergic disorders, um, it now becomes reasonable to consider MCAS as a possible diagnosis in those patients and to pursue evaluation for it, particularly if evaluation for other uh, uh, diagnoses doesn't seem to pan out. All right. So talking, uh, it, well, before I ask anything more, Dr. Avrin, it is 8.57 probably now. How long would you like to go? I know we said about seven to eight. Do you want to stop hard at eight o'clock? I know you, I want to be cognizant of your time and we appreciate whatever time you have and just even the hour that you spent with us. Uh, Kenja, I think the clocks in your house are a little off or maybe on your computer. Oh my gosh. Because it's not 8.57, oh, it's actually 7.59. Seven, seven, I'm sorry, 7.59. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we, I, I did read it. I'm trying to manage several different screens. Dr. I'm sorry, I did read it. 7.59. Well, I'm okay with going another half hour, but at 8.30, we really need to uh, wrap it up. All right, so I'm gonna go back to, this is a great question, going back to the genetic component and about what we speculate and what we're learning about um, MCAS and where it comes from and what causes it and these different mutations. Somebody asked a good question that said, if you're going back to, uh, let me read it, we'll go back. So if you're talking about mast cells, if not all mast cells always share the same mutation, and this is going back to what you were talking about before, are you, indicating some of the mutations are possible de novo, de novo uh, or even perhaps most are, meaning like they're spontaneous new mutations, um, such as in response to trauma or stress or the environment. Well, I apologize if I didn't read that appropriately. No, I, that's okay. Well. Let, let me, what we understand so far from, again, preliminary research 
and a whole lot more research is needed to really get a definitive understanding of all this is that there are mutations present in the mast cells or at least in some proportion of the mast cells in just about everybody who has MCAS and that it's not just one particular mutation that we see over and over and over and over again in just about every MCAS patient. Uh, so it's not a situation you have in mastocytosis where just about every patient has a kit codon 816 mutation. And instead, uh, it is a huge menagerie of mutations that are seen across uh, a large assortment of uh, genes of regulatory importance to the mast cell. That's what's being seen from one mast cell patient to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's, a, it's just a different set of mutations in the mutated mast cells in each patient. Um, I don't doubt that over time, as more research gets done, we'll start to identify at least some patterns of this. For example, there's developing suspicion that um, the connective tissue anomalies that you see in hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome might be consequential to one or more of these mutations in the mast cells in, in MCAS. Um, and therefore it would kind of make sense if we were to take a subset of MCAS patients who all happen to have, uh, who all happen to additionally have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, it would kind of make sense if we were to find in the mast cells, um, in those uh, patients, uh, not just a truly random assortment of mutations, but perhaps at least one or two mutations that we just see recurrently, we see persistently in patient after patient after patient who has not only MCAS, but also hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos. And in, when you start finding patterns like that, that makes you then start wondering, aha, maybe these recurrent mutations happen to be what's driving the hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos part of the overall MCAS that's present in, in that patient. Um, but again, this is all theorizing, hypothesizing that research has not been done and it would be nice to see it done, uh, but we are sure not would. there yet. Um, now, let me also be clear. Uh, I think I alluded to this before, but um, if, if I re repeat myself, so be it. This is important. The great majority of these, we know this from the preliminary research, and yes, it's preliminary, so it could always change in the end. But what we understand so far is that the great majority of these mutations that are found in the mast cells in an MCAS patient, or at least in some proportion of the mast cells in any given MCAS patient's body, these are not inherited. They're not inborn. They're not congenital. They're not what we call germline mutations that uh, would be present. I mean, the nature of a congenital mutation is such that it's present at conception and therefore is going to be replicated into literally every cell in the patient's body from conception to death. And that's not what's going on with the great majority of the mutations in the dysfunctional mast cells in an MCAS patient's body. And instead, the research strongly suggests that uh, the, these mutations in the mast cells 
or acquired mutations. We use the term uh, medically, we use the term somatic mutations as opposed to the germline mutations that are the inborn or congenital or inherited mutations. But the somatic mutations are acquired at various stages in a patient's life, typically starting relatively early. Uh, but we strongly suspect that as time goes on and a patient gets exposed to various stressors, uh, various stressors have varying abilities to induce additional somatic mutations, which may explain why over time a patient's mast cell activation syndrome uh, occasionally comes to escalate its baseline level of misbehavior of the uh, dysfunctional mast cells. And these, these uh, I'm not talking about just a, a short little flare of symptoms in reaction to some you know, uh, incidental exposure. I'm talking about a major sustained, often permanent uh, worsening of symptoms. And th th that's what I'm talking about with uh, when I use the word escalation. And these escalations, uh, what we've been observing is that they tend to shortly follow a major stressor, either a, a major physical stressor or a major psychological or emotional stressor. And by shortly follow, I mean anywhere from a few days to at most a few months. Um, but it seems that major stressors um, have the ability to induce uh, additional mutations. And if they happen to be mutations uh, in a gene, of regulatory importance in the mast cell, then that can that has potential for causing additional misbehavior by the mast cell and additional inappropriate production and release of various mediators by the mutated mast cell. And it's that inappropriate mediator production and release, regardless of whether it's driven by mutations, as we think is going on in most MCAS patients, or sometimes the mast cells actually have no mutations. Um, they're completely normal. It's just they're being triggered. They're being provoked by other processes like a cancer or, or an autoimmune disease. And, um, but one way or another, if, if the mast cell is producing and releasing various mediators inappropriately, there are gonna be consequences to that because these mediators have a huge range of effects all throughout the body. Well, talking about mediators and the effects around the body, can you please talk about PMDD? So people that have, or women that have, like me, that have a lot more symptoms or seem to be symptomatic, maybe around the time they ovulate, around the time of their period, maybe it's been diagnosed with PMDD, any kind of links, correlations. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of speculation and just a lot of nuance yeah. that go into it, but would you mind touching on that for us? Yeah, PMDD is one of actually uh, a considerable number of menstrual and, and female genital tract disorders that we're increasingly coming to suspect might be manifestations of uh, assorted variants or patterns of mast cell activation syndrome. Um, and um, it, it's at least at a superficial level, it's kind of easy to understand how uh, mast cell activation syndrome might underlie PMDD. But again, keep in mind the hard research to establish a definitive connection between the two con conditions has, has not been conducted yet. It has not been conducted any more for PMDD than 
for hypermobile Ehlers Danlos or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue or I mean I can I can name a few hundred other uh, diseases too in which we're suspecting that uh, uh, MCAS is is underlying um, a significant proportion of the population that's bearing each of these diseases. But but here's the biology that's relevant. Um, it, most people know that as a woman goes through her cycle, um, there are significant fluctuations going on in the woman's body, particularly in the bloodstream, in the levels, the, the concentrations of various um, uh, sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone and so forth. Well, it turns out that um, there are receptors on the surfaces of the mast cells for all of these major sex hormones. And therefore it's not too surprising that as a sex hormone comes to, uh, as it's floating through the, the blood and it comes to uh, dock, so to speak, with a receptor for that hormone, it's sitting on the surface of a mast cell, it could drive uh, uh, activation of the mast cell. Probably not so much an issue as long as they're normal mast cells. I think where the problem comes in is when some proportion of the mast cells in the woman's body are not normal. They're, they're abnormal, they're dysfunctional. They are the mast cells that essentially define that woman to have a mast cell activation syndrome. And the docking, there is potential for uh, the docking of um, uh, the sex hormone molecule with the receptor on the mast cell to drive not merely a normal extent of activation of that mast cell, but actually an abnormal extent of activation with abnormal mediator production and release that's gonna lead to a wider range of symptoms and more severe symptoms than you would expect to see in a woman with just normal mast cells. So, um, uh, in, in some of these women, uh, yes, you can gain better control over the PMDD by uh, applying various treatments that may impede the fluctuations of the hormone levels. But in some PMDD patients, um, when those hormonal type approaches don't prove to be as helpful as everybody might like, it's possible you might, especially in those patients in whom you do the diagnostic work and you prove that, oh, it's not just PMDD they have, no, they have a, a clear case of MCAS. Well, then in those patients, you apply mast cell targeted treatment and you might suddenly start seeing significantly better control over the PMDD than you were able to get previously from any standard, so to speak, PMDD targeted treatment. Yeah, uh, and I won't go into my full story. I've shared it before. I mean, but this is definitely something that I struggle with personally. Um, and it, along with these, with PMDD, uh, several of us, many of us have countless, I won't, numerous, GYN conditions that also have possible plausible links to MCAS, including interstitial cystitis, um, you know, a bunch of different things that's in the GYN bladder area. Um, I know also a lot of us deal with swelling, uh, whether it's in the abdomen uh, or in the lower abdomen in the pelvic area. Is there anything specific that you've found or that you can say that works or helps with the swelling portion of all of this? And I will take it a step further and say also swelling systemically. Um, again, something that I know I personally have been dealing with as well, not just in my stomach, but uh, in the lower abdomen, whether it's certain times a month, but now more systemically in certain areas of the body. 
quick touch on this one because <laughs> um, a lot of us are suffering from it, Dr. Afrin. No, uh, I'm I'm sorry to say uh, that if H1 blockers don't prove to be sufficiently helpful, then I don't know of anybody who's been able to identify other drugs which reliably um, across all such swollen mast cell patients, any other drug that will reliably work for them. I think in general, if a given mast cell patient together with that patient's uh, treating doctor, if they are patient and persistent and methodical in stepping through trials of the many different uh, treatments that are already available for focusing on mast cell disease, it's been my experience, most of those patients actually do eventually, some patients sooner, others later, but eventually uh, most of those patients do get to a point where they find some cocktail highly unique to the individual patient that actually does get them doing significantly better than their pre-treatment baseline the majority of the time. But I've, uh, I've just not found any drugs beyond the H1 blockers that uh, can reliably help with swelling. You got to be careful with some of these drugs too. I mean, I know some patients who are bothered enough by swelling, they actually come to be regularly taking diuretics. Um, and yeah, a diuretic might, again, it's, it's not so reliable in a mast cell patient. <laughs> Uh, but a diuretic uh, that makes you, you know, increase your urination might be able to reduce some swelling, but you got to be careful with diuretics. They also have potential to uh, throw off, uh, sometimes to a significant degree, uh, other metabolic aspects in the body. And um, you know, the patient and the doctor have got to do some pretty careful thinking before they commit to chronic use of a diuretic for uh, mast cell targeted swelling. Honestly, it's an approach that I tend to not take with my patients. And I would also say that it's not just a, a pharmaceutical approach that part of the recipe that works for each individual patient also involves other factors, um, lifestyle, possible supplements. Um, and somebody asked along the lines of supplements as a natural mass cell stabilizer, what are your thoughts on Moringa powder tea? I've never heard of this, so I'm just- yeah, I, have, I have a few patients who have been on it. Um, honestly, I, ju I just can't remember if any of my patients who are using it have actually uh, found it to be substantially beneficial. And um, I, I'm not aware of any research at all of the, the utility of Moringa tea specifically in the mast cell patient population. Um, so I, I, I mean, we, we have to understand there are an awful lot of products, an uh, awful lot of molecules in the natural environment. Uh, Mother Nature has blessed us with a bounty of molecules that do have varying abilities to inhibit inflammation in one respect or another in the human body. And let's keep in mind that one of the cardinal symptoms of inflammation is edema or swelling. So there, there are quite a number of uh, natural, so to speak, uh, molecules that um, at least in theory might have the ability to improve inflammatory symptoms, including swelling in various patients. But I just don't know of any way at all at present to reliably predict which 
of these molecules, whether natural, so to speak, versus pharmaceutical, I don't know of any way to reliably predict which of them is uh, best going to help with swelling or any other aspect of inflammation. I think it's a matter of patiently, persistently, methodically trying the various options. Um, there are very few drugs where we've come to understand pretty reliably um, the, the benefits those, those drugs bring. And I guess it again goes that it's all so independent to the person and their body and what they've got going on and what works best for them. Different so patients about- have different mutations, different patterns of mutations, and therefore they're probably going to respond to different medications and different uh, combinations of medications. We'll eventually figure it all out, but give us at least several decades. <laughs> After we've been suffering for decades, Dr. Afrin, come on. Hey, 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 hey. Uh, <laughs> listen, you know, I, I've been sounding, you know, negative about how long it's going to take for additional research to be done. But at the same time, it has to be kept in mind that for all of human history, this disease existed. And yet for hundreds, for thousands of years, These patients were out there and they went from their earliest years all the way through to death, just never being recognized for what's wrong with them. In fact, as a result, because nobody could ever identify a diagnosis in them, most people, their doctors, their family, their friends probably came to think they were psychosomatic. Uh, and, And so we're finally at a point where we actually do know the disease exists. We're able to test for it. We can prove its presence. And in fact, even though we've only known about it for about a dozen years, turns out we've already got a boatload of drugs that have been found helpful in various MCAS patients. And that's a whole lot better uh, situation than you got with an awful lot of other diseases that we've known about way longer than mast cell disease, but for which we still have few to no treatments available. So yeah, it's kind of like that lemonade glass that's half full. You can focus on the negative on, on oh, it's, it's half empty. Uh, or you can look at the good side and, and say, yeah, we got challenges for sure, but uh, you know, when you t- especially when you're talking about a disease that's as prevalent as we're, we're, we're now thinking it is, isn't it a great thing that we understand it exists and we are learning how to recognize it and we can diagnose it and we can usually effectively treat it? I mean, I'm, again, I'm not saying that treatment is is easy. I mean, if there were anything easy about this disease, we would have figured it out a long time ago. Uh, the, the only problems left to be solved are the complicated ones, and it doesn't get any more complicated than MCAS. Uh, so it's good that we can recognize it, diagnose it, and treat it such that most people, again, with enough patience and persistence and method, between the patient and the doctor, most patients get better, which is way better than we've had for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So that's good. I agree. I'm, and I'm so thankful to be, you know, to have my own journey in an own way through helping the community just get information and answers and work with you, Dr. Afrin. And we're all so thankful and just grateful for your time and what you've done to help us move forward and just even just little steps have been such big steps for so many of us, uh, even in the last five years. So it's 825. Uh, I have two questions. I think they're fairly simple. Uh, if you sure. wouldn't mind, one is how often is MCAS seen in men? Um, the available preliminary research 
says that there are roughly four to five cases of MCAS in women for every case we find in a man. And the reasons for that difference are quite murky. Uh, it is, uh, and probably it's not just one reason. There probably are multiple reasons. One reason could simply be uh, the sex difference, that there are differences in the, uh, the balances of the, the, the levels and balances of the various sex hormones between men and women. Um, thank God, uh, life would be a lot more boring uh, were it not for those differences. Um, but because there are receptors on the mast cells for uh, these uh, sex hormones, it does create the potential for the disease to behave differently in the different sexes. So that's one uh, possible explanation. Another possibility is actually a, a, a cultural consideration. In most cultures around the globe, men tend to not seek medical attention unless they are either completely incapacitated, uh, they cannot work uh, uh, due to whatever illness they have, or they have some very substantial cosmetic issue that will prevent them from, uh, well, will impede their success at landing a mate. Um, whereas women tend to uh, seek medical evaluation and care um, at, at, shall we say, lower thresholds of distress. Um, th these, these cultural issues have been recognized for decades, if not centuries. Um, and it might explain some of the difference, the sex imbalance that's been observed so far in MCAS, but we just need a whole lot more research to really get definitive answers. What's the other simple question you got? Well, maybe it's not that simple, but just um, the link to multiple chemical sensitivities and MCAS, ours, is there a specific population of those that have multiple chemical sensitivities that clearly does not have MCAS? Or is there, because there's a lot of overlaps. So is there any differentiation that we've been able to figure out? Yeah. Um, between... There is some um, research that is uh, in progress. Actually, it's been completed. Some, some early uh, research looking at the intersection between MCAS and multiple chemical sensitivity and uh, some, some interesting findings there about the intersection. And I, uh, I, I just don't think it would be uh, appropriate for me to comment further until that um, uh, publication uh, emerges in, in the literature, uh, the stealing thunder from the authors. So um, fair enough. I, uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious that um, many patients with multiple chemical sensitivity, there's good cause to suspect MCAS might also be present. And uh, that said, I, in my own opinion, we never go assuming that somebody has MCAS. Uh, and if, uh, well, we almost never go assuming. And as long as there is some way to uh, pin down uh, proof, to, to, to actually prove by appropriate testing that they really do have uh, a state of inappropriate activation of their mast cells. Uh, the patient usually is much better served both in the short run and especially in the long run by nailing down the proof rather than just assuming. Um, I understand there are a lot of places in the world where unfortunately 
they can't access the testing and it probably will be a long time before they can. Uh, and then maybe in those places in the world, they have no choice at present, but to assume a diagnosis and just empirically try to treat. Um, you, you do the best you can. You know, every, everybody does that. They do the best they can. But if you've got the opportunity to um, really investigate a suspicion of MCAS, um, I, I urge that that be done. All right, well, great. Well, right on time, Dr. Affen, we are at 8.31. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for going a half an hour over what we allotted. I'm sorry to everybody that we didn't get to your question, both on Zoom and Facebook and those that email. We, we do the best we can when we do these and we just appreciate Dr. Afrin's time and his willingness to just come on and just answer questions um, from us. And obviously some questions are longer and harder to answer. And even sometimes the simplest ones uh, don't have a simple answer. So, um, and it's important for all of us to really understand the science and where we are and where we have to go to really truly understand all of these questions that we have. And I know Dr. Afrin is much like all of us that wishes that we were much further along. However, as Dr. Afrin said, we've made considerable strides comparably to what people have suffered with. So um, I'm thankful for being a part of this, a small part of it. I'm so appreciative for working with you, Dr. Afrin. Thank you again. And uh, I'm excited to continue to do this again. We just really appreciate your time, Dr. Afrin. Have a great night and a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. Um, Dr. Afrin, is there anything last, anything you want to say last time before we end it? Oh, if you get me started at this point, you know, there's going to be no stopping me, but we, we've all got things to do at this hour of the evening, especially the folks in Europe who are well past midnight. Um, so let's just bring it to a close. All right. Well, Dr. Ben, thank you so much again. Everybody really appreciates your time in doing these. Um, people love the live Q&As and just you answering questions, and we just really appreciate it. So thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate everybody who stayed tuned, your patience, and we'll talk again. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.